Oh my fucking god, dude. Oh, it's too real right now. It's too real. It's too real. You know what? You know what? You know what? Fucking standing ovation. Fucking standing ovation. Death parade. I'm, I'm just, to be completely honest with you guys, I don't even know how to articulate my feelings right now. Yeah, I'm just in a state of awe and wonder with the progression of this episode across the board. 10 out of 10, just incredible. And how it furthers this series. One of the best episodes this season of any series that I'm watching currently as a whole. Honestly, fucking seriously. The best episode of Death Parade, hands down. How it dives in to the psychological aspects of the human condition what it does for, you know, the quest of this series and the purpose of, the inquest of, you know, understanding all these psychological aspects and diving into them, showcasing the darkness of humanity. <sighs> Dude, it's just the animation this episode, the symbolism, the cinematography, some of these scenes just across every, every single formal aspect that I can point to is amazing. Let's just dive into it. Let's just dive into things. And I don't even feel as though I need to tell you, you know, the specific this episode. Everybody must have been captivated in one way or another by what this episode did. That last scene, dude, where they cut into the noisy cell last theater ED and splice that with, you know, Shimada just going in, losing himself in his rage and the satisfaction of, you know, getting vengeance on Tatsumi. At this point, you see him stabbing into the box. Ona just trying to hold him back with all her might. The music is playing like Shimada writhing, I mean Tatsumi writhing in pain with that sinister grin on his face. He's like, I'm teaching you. I'm te Nothing can be obtained without a sacrifice. Yo, Tatsumi, Detective Tatsumi's character this episode just quickly spiraled into the depths of depravity. So much so that he dragged Shimada into it with him and I love to see how everything played out and the reconciliation between the two Let's kind of start from the beginning before I, I get back into them and dive into you know the depth of the dialogue this episode as well The animation throughout that sequence the cinematography When they're the you know the the fucking air hockey rally when they're just going in when the uh, Shimada sings a couple of pucks and Tatsumi's just writhing in pain, the memory sequences, finding out that Tatsumi was watching, you know, Shimada's sister and saw the, the incident where the dude raped her and brutalized her and he did it for his own twisted warped sense of justice that he developed after getting vengeance for his wife. Straight up on that Yagami light mentality, alright? Check the reference. Straight up on that Yagami. And just the way that it developed and the progression of the episode, as well as on the side. This is exactly what known as Endgame was for, in, for giving Dekim this particular, you know, these particular pair, these murderers. He's, uh, something's awakened inside of him. Emotions are swirling inside of Dekim from Ona's provocation, from how she felt throughout this. And she, Nona knew that Ona was in terrible at this. I still can't put my finger 100% on what her end game is and how everything relates with Lotus Flower GG. I think I need to do a separate theory crafting video on that before the end of the season, but... Oh, the impact of this episode, dude. Just the dialogue. Ona's words to deck him at the end. Where she's like, you're just like him. And you see it when Tatsumi's talking. He's like... Arbiter, is that the word you just lose? I like that. That's what I've been doing. He lights up a series like I've been passing judgment. The sinister, fiendish smiles on this man's face and his twisted, warped logic and satisfaction. You see that smile on his face where he hears his wife's voice thanking him for murdering her killer. And he, he takes it upon himself. He's like, being a detective was a godsend for me. I could pass judgment on all these filthy bastards and cleanse the world. Like, some things have to be sacrificed in order to get what you want, Shimada. Do it. Do it now. He's like, you're gonna kill me twice here? And Shimada, man, the, the, the spiral and the pull into depravity, you see that he murdered, the way he murders this dude. And some people might be wondering how Shimada died, because they kind of gloss over it. I'm like, even I, at first, I'm like, how did Shimada die then? Because for them to both be there, we, I see the interrelation with, you know, how he tied in with his sister and everything, how he, Shimada was actually one that murdered Tatsumi. 
as him being the spectator to his sister's rape, and he walked into the apartment, just stabs him straight out without confirming anything, which is fucking crazy, Shimada, honestly. But I feel as though Shimada died because the dude that, you know, the, the rapist dude, the fucking crazy woman stalker, like, he stabbed him as well. He stabbed him in the side. He got a fucking slice in to Shimada before Shimada finished him off. So I feel like he just bled out on top of Tatsumi, and they died like a similar interval, you know, from blood loss. So that's my theory as to how Shimada died. But regardless, you see the path that vengeance takes people down. You see the path of even, you know, a sense of righteousness in what they were doing. It's straight up the Yagami complex. It's the Yagami complex. At least for Tatsumi. For Shimada, you know, the, the conversation with Ona trying to plead with him. She tells him the truth about the game. That he can be reincarnated and reunited with the sister that he sacrificed everything for. That he, uncle, he loved above, above all else. And he trades that for the void. For this one moment of pleasure. And, you know, getting the vengeance. Shutting up this man who is taunting him and who is involved. That he pins all his anger towards. And satisfying his desire in that one moment. You see the smile on his face. Afterwards, he's like, I've done it. Oh my goodness, dude. The depravity and the exposition, the depths of darkness of the human soul, and as well as combined with Ona's words where she's like, human beings are simple. Human beings are simple. You know, we're swayed by the, the simplest of emotions and they affect us in big ways. You're a fool, Deccan, for thinking we're all complex. You're not doing anything but, but like driving this to the surface. You're no better than Tatsumi at this stage. You see how shocked, how hurt, you see the pain in Deccan as he comes to this realization. You know what the emotion is he's, he's experiencing at this point? And it's relevant with how they flash to what Nona says back, what she said back in episode two, with the, the most central emotion that human beings fear, and it translates and ripples out into everything else, is fear. And that's what Deccan is feeling right now. It's the fear that all this time he never truly understood. The fear that he doesn't even have an understanding that he claims to, and a fear that he doesn't contain the emotions that he, je he clearly does because he's feeling this in the first place, which is what Nona wants. Going back to Nona's conversation with Castro and Quinn, creating an arbiter, you know, with human emotions that truly understands emotions. And Ona being there is twofold part of her judgment as well. And it seems like we're going to start going into the end game with Ona, Nona, Lotus Sour Gigi, and everything like that. And her and Ona's backstory with next week's episode, it looks like Ona's part of the game, and it's called Storyteller, potentially, you know, tying back to the Chavo book and everything like that. But I, I, I'm done. I'm done. You, you, I, I can't even. If I haven't imparted to you the depth of this episode at this point by now, and just how beautiful everything was going to put together from the animation, the cinematography, the writing, the exposition, the progression, the character development, and the exposition of the darkness of the human soul and the depravity of them. They're both, you see the shot on the one fucking devil mask at the end. They're both going to the void, right? I, 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 it's, it's so twisted, it's so warped, and it's hard to, you know, grapple with issues of morality at this stage in, you know, the episode and in the anime as a whole. But the way they're doing it, Madhouse, man, I have to applaud you. In both adaptations and original content, you are one of the kings of psychological anime. Done. Done. Fucking Death Note. I'm just, I'm just pulling these out of the top of my head and I was talking about Yagami. Yeah, fucking Death Note, Kaiji, Parasite, this fucking season, Hunter Hunter, everything that Madhouse touches in a psychological realm. They use the cinematography, the animation, and specific shots, and the way that they write and script things and pace it out to showcase all of these complex psychological themes, you know, issues of morality, the human condition, and everything like that. And this series has done a gone leaps and bounds towards that end. I can't wait to find out how things resolve themselves, what's going on, what you know, if Nona's plan is going according to it, if Lotus Flower GG is aware of exactly what's going on and how, what the end, you know, grander scheme on, you know, a bigger, larger level is of what's going on with the interplay of Deckham and Ona and everything like that. So it'll be interesting to find that out. Just the feels, though, the hit, the impact of this episode. I was sitting there watching, I was just straight up like, oh my fucking God, dude. In that last sequence with the fucking noisy cell about track in the background. Dude, too real. Let me know your thoughts on this episode of Death Parade. I'm out. Peace.